It's my pleasure to be here to introduce today's speaker. It's uh, the ARIA award-winning musician Dave Graney, who's uh, recently released his uh, first book, a memoir called 1001 Australian Nights. Please welcome Dave Graney. Thank you. Thanks for coming along. Very pleasant area this I find in Melbourne. Now uh, I must apologise to you uh, if my talk doesn't go for as long as advertised but um, uh, as you may have seen me walk very slowly up here I've been trying to uh, use up a amount of time doing uh, stage business as they say and also my voice you may detect I have had a recent cold or something and uh, but uh, it's given my voice a very rewarding low register, which is good for talking, which is, uh, I've been doing some readings for my book, but I also am a performing musician and I have to do some uh, shows in a couple of weeks, so I'm hoping in the latter of the week to bring my high register back for, for the falsetto shrieks and uh, screams that are required in that part of my life. And I was thinking about the future, as I'm going to be talking about, wouldn't it be great in the future if there was uh, endless um, talk in what might be newspapers or social networks about the conditioning of musicians and writers' um, bodies <laughs> as they attempt their work as you see in Melbourne, we're bombarded by uh, articles about quads, calves, AC joints, groins, ankles of football players on uh, radio, television and all the newspapers. Wouldn't that be great to hear about Les Murray's you know, uh, new diet or something? Because he, he did write a very good book, book of poems while in a... Uh, in a state which he described as having shit on his kidneys. So, uh, and then when he got over his uh, kidney stones or whatever, he wrote a very different kind of book. So it would have been good if we could have kept up with his physical condition via the, say, 7.15 on the ABC News or something. Now to the arts physical conditioning report. Anyway... Uh, thanks for coming along and uh, uh, let me say first of all I was asked to do this talk many weeks ago and it sounded pretty easy. Then I was asked what I would be talking about so as to sizzle it forwardly in the Wheeler Centre calendar for forthcoming events. That sounded easy as well. I was at home staring at the computer being assaulted by a screen of nostalgic sludge on Facebook and said, my topic will be Will the social networks encourage people to think of the future, the unknown? Then I forgot about it until the deadline approached. Uh, I need a burning hot deadline to, to be th threatening me before I spring into action, usually a weakness I know. My topic was going to be quite rhetorical and answer itself negatively. I'm not a young person of have and have some experience in life, though I like to dispute when I'm charged with being either cynical or ironic or negative. The world I grew up in was ironic. That's how people talked. Red-headed people were called bluey. Fat guys were called tiny. Voltaire wrote Candide several century, centuries ago about a young hopeful person who goes about in the world think he, thinking he's in the best of all possible worlds no matter what terrible events happen all around. Candide has been retold, reread, and filmed many times over the last century. It's not new to question the world, but some public commentators still seem to see it as odd if you don't join in the applause for overtly manipulative political operators or their opinionated cheerleaders. Short memories and shorter attention spans. The current alternative national leader, Tony Abbott, in the Republican debate of the late 90s, a debate which was never really decided, only crawled by semantics over whether the head of state would be a president or a governor general, also whether they would be popularly elected or chosen by the prime minister, for instance, as, is, as the current one is. Tony Abbott smilingly appeared to appeal to people's worst natures by asking, would you want a head of state to be elected by politicians? 
ever since it's been talked of as a given that the public rejected the idea of change. Another thing you may remember is the former alternative head of state, Malcolm Turnbull, was then head of the Republican movement. I'm getting around to my futuristic stuff in a minute. <laughs> Prone to wandering off topic, I'm sorry. Um, there's also the current political debate over climate change. Among scientists, there's no argument. The conservative media and political parties have made it an argument over science. Science is abused by the media as being wasteful, big government item. And its very nature is it, that it, it doesn't give definitive opinions on things, which the media, of, of course, hates. And, um, and uh, in their, their mania for balanced balanced opinions, they'll have one negative about climate change, give an equal weight to thousands in, in the uh, positive about it. The public is ill-informed Ill by the old school media. Tony Abbott has again smilingly appealed to people's worst instincts, instincts by saying to Green voters, why do you want a market-based carbon price when you so distrust markets? Tony Abbott is an annoying type who does nothing but appeal to people's worst instincts. He's a specialist in dead ends. On whose behalf is he appealing? Giant business, of course, who are also clamouring for nuclear power, a still futurist concept. One of the hopes for people to get information out in this frozen political scene are the new social networks. I am a musician. Musicians have experience in this field. If, for instance, you turn up at a venue and the club owner tells you that the phone has been ringing off the hook all day, you know you will be playing to an empty room. It's one of those things. If people think of doing something, sometimes that's enough. They've done it, thinking about it. Musicians also put up events on social networks where they used to put up posters in the physical world. Musicians know that if there are hordes of people responding to these online virtual expositions of coming events to them, they have come and gone. They do not turn up in the real world. Australians are fools for new technology and social networks are the same. MySpace has come and gone. This was the musician's favourite, the player's front. If we were talking of a virtual city, MySpace would be a haunted mansion on the hill. Facebook would be an inner city modish block of apartments. It replaced MySpace. It was the audience's favourite. The musicians straggled along and tried to set up some space again, but it was pretty hopeless. They were basically homeless drifters on the internet. People talk a lot of jive over Facebook. They're not like they're taking over the back, talking over the back fence through a loud hailer, of course, but that makes it more exciting. Twitter may be the best hope for some sort of activity being affected in the real world. It's a more humble thing, like a small car that drives around the place in a predictable fashion. An ice cream van doesn't carry a lot of shit around with it. Just today, the stream of stuff clattering along behind the cans on a piece of string. But I was going to talk about the future and would any of this make people think of the future? It's one of those funny things though, all this amazing digital technology has made the past and the present so accessible it's dizzying. Getting our bearings is difficult. The young will be the ones to find a way through it all. Now you rarely hear people talk of the future. NASA is over. All the money that the US poured into, into exploring space a project that generated so many technological advances that we enjoy every day. MRI machines, scratch-resistant lenses for glasses, developments for automation, medical engineering. Now all that's being poured into weaponry. Still, we have the porn industry, which is another great engine of development in technology. The porn industry invented how to pay securely for things on the internet, for instance. <laughs> The church is giving us nothing as usual. <laughs> well, perhaps porn in a roundabout way. Guilt, laws, proprietary, driving things underground, etc. You may have read uh, the uh, program, A Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has been closed in the US uh, this week due to lack of money. They must be giving it to uh, some uh, needy weapons manufacturer 
As a musician, you also experience the change in the ways that digital technology has freed the players from the banks, but also freed the audience from the idea of paying for anything. The worst is that everything being available has, has taken away the value that rarity gave to things. Thirty years ago, it was exciting to see that picture of Iggy Pop standing on the hands of the crowd at the Cincinnati Pop Festival of 1968 when the legendary jar of peanut butter appeared out of the crowd. And he is there, standing on a sea of hands, smiling and pasting great handfuls of that stuff on himself and flinging it into the crowd. I mean, I heard about it and I imagined it. Years later, I saw a picture on a record cover. Now it's there on YouTube, the entire performance for anybody to see. It's amazing. I got a CD in the mail just this week from a young fellow asking me to produce him. I am no producer. He said he wanted to sound like Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska, which is a, a very minimalist record with voice and guitar, or Nick Cave's Boatman's Call, which is a very minimalist piano album. I got, got back to him saying that those records were all well and good as aberrations in the careers of those artists who had hitherto made thrilling, ferocious, upbeat, loud and exciting slabs of sound which they had thrown at the world like handfuls of peanut butter. In that contextual squall of their own summoning, it was interesting for people to hear, deep within the still reverberating sound of their former actual work, these quieter, more sombre recordings. I said to the young fellow who could access these whole lifetimes in an instant that he had rushed to a part of the story, a small part, and that had these artists put out these discs first, no one would have listened. The future was something he'd already, already raced to with references gathered from the past. I think we're all stuck, hovering on the spot, and only something big and terrible will shock us out of it. Personally, if the internet was cut off tomorrow, I would be happy. It's only making things cruder and sending people spiralling inwards. It's closing off to the public spaces and to the future. It's a dead end, a kind of hell in the sense of Jean-Paul Sartre. It's a space where people can experiment with identity and selves to their heart's content without ever really spilling any blood. Yes, Australians are mad for technology and gadgets. I'm talking about many things from the perspective of a musician. Something is missing in the music world, really. A large elephant in the room, and that's just radio. It's a black hole, an event horizon. Pretty much everything that's recorded flows into and is never heard again. It's an old rusty technology and people source music themselves from the internet. They can control what they hear and buy what they like. Again, it sounds great, but where's the public space? The big mob is being exposed to something all at once, the happening. Internet radio is dull, it's outside time and space. Yet every dwelling in Australia and every car has a radio. Turn it on and it's white noise with the same oldies playlist 24 hours a day. They say they know what they're doing, but even tradesmen are turning off FM radio. Why is it broken? How did it get to be so hard? Something from the past. The idea of a playlist of songs, not like a top 40, was invented in the 1950s in the USA. Prior to that, people thought uh, that the audience would not put up with hearing the same shit over and over. <laughs> Sometimes you have to look to the past to see possibilities that once existed that are closed to us now. And Robert Storrs, the man who invented the playlist, said, I became convinced that people demand their favourites over and over while in the army during the Second World War. I remember vividly what used to happen in restaurants here in the States. The customers would throw their nickels into the jukebox and come up repeatedly with the same tune. So there you go. People thought it was a totally crazy idea. People would hear the same songs over and over. They wouldn't put up with it, was the cry. It went mad all across the world. It was fine while they played new music. In my life, I remember cities in Australia all having several AM radio stations that played new music all day, every day, and the public wanted it. That's an idea from the past that sounds like it's from the future. I'll just have a drink of water here. Chewed up 10 seconds there. <laughs> While writing this, I got a tweet from the unknown on Twitter. 
it was a whole Facebook page about unknown things. I was being fingered by the unknown. I put the word future unknown into Twitter and found the page needing to be freshened every couple of minutes. Often the same proverb about the future accredited to, accredited to, to unknown, but it was something. There was also a character who tweets into the void as man from the future. I'm following him. I think the man from the future is going to be big. No image at all, just 140 characters transmitted in daily sessions. This way, through such a tight inlet, he can worm his way directly into your brain. Like any hero or cult leader, he pimps us and we believe. I'm already sold on him. I need a voice from the future. Outside of the banal, mediocre gridlock, so much of the current public discourse hovers within. I will read you here in the real world as if I was an advanced man for a visiting prophet some of his words over the last two days. So these came from man from the future. If you are a Twitter person, you can look up man from the future. He says stuff like this. You are handicapped potential gods born with amnesia progressively deteriorating, but few of you will find true existence. Boom. <laughs> Homo sapiens have poor judgment. You treat water, flora, and your planet as though they are your servants. You need to talk to water. Water can memorize your thoughts and be your transmitter and receiver. There is more to life than you perceive. I remember the year 3844. We still had a few leaders, but they learned to say everything what was on their minds. Everything. Anything. It is important not to cloak your thoughts. You will learn it. Imagine that your leader say anything what is on his mind. I think this. I think that. Farting makes me smile. I have this doubt, that idea. Very impressive, the man from the future. Entertainers, melody players, and simulators are very popular in this time. I find it spectacular. Then an answer to Tom Cruise. You are not Tom Cruise, the actor. This is very knowing. Beings of my kind love benefit. We love to do something only if that will give us interest. We do everything for the interest and benefit. You old cultures refuse to admit that you do things for your own interest. You rather pretend that you do it because you are good and noble. It is interesting that you are not yet aware of what gives you benefit and what does not give you benefit. It is challenging to compress thoughts in small stream of symbols, very little board space, as you would say, my dear old timers. You feel that ejecting gases from your holes is embarrassing, but it has deeper meaning. You avoid to face that you are a biological entity. The being of my kind constructed something that you, call popular, that you popularly call time travel. We use hosts to experience location and time. You know, I, I've started to believe in the man from the future. He argues with people occasionally. Um, in my time you need to study for 500 years to become a doctor. <laughs> Bipedal walk is interesting. It is hard to believe that once upon a time we moved that way. You are a very passive being who does not utilize potential. It is a pity. You have many potential destinies on our records. It is fun how you perceive time travelers in your culture. They are always very careful about not touching or saying or doing anything. Your little global connecting system is very small and the biggest amount of data is centered around sperm ejection. I understand your satirical tone. You never connected with the center. You pretend that you did. It is your predominant feature. There, I thought he was talking directly to me, but you know. Man of the Future has that idea. I'm afraid that's where my uh, talk of uh, the future and the unknown ends. Part of the session is, uh, if I have inspired you to ask any questions, please make it so.
I just wondered if you're like a uh, like an alcoholic or a cigarette smoker that really desperately wants to give up the internet but just can't. So if it was actually taken away so you couldn't actually access access it, would that be better for you? Do you think? I would love that, yes. Yeah, I'm pathetic, yeah. Uh, I have a friend who lives on an island off of Thursday Island. I grew up with him. We're in the poor streets of Mount Gambier. He has to... Uh, catch a dinghy from Thursday Island to his island. He has one generator to run his beer fridge. That's it. Uh, I'm sure many people would be jealous of that lifestyle. I meant to say about the future and the unknown things. As a musician, you co- confront many things that are people cannot hear or see things they don't know. They literally like, you can't see or hear them. And it's a thing with music that... Uh, and the, the, the very smart people who run commercial radio s- at laugh, at, laugh at the idea that they play m- new music or subject their audience to it because people would find it intensely annoying. And I think that is true. But uh, it, it wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case. That's what I meant by the unknown and the future. Hello. I know almost nothing about the social network. Good. Not missing out on anything. Now, the current media just oppresses me beyond yes. anything. And uh, all you've said about Tony Abbott, I share exactly, and I can't see any answer from the media. Yes. I was hoping you would tell me that the social network was going to have an answer for us. Well, they had great hope for it in the election of Obama in America. A lot of that was driven by d- its more direct communication, I think. But... Uh, I, I really don't know because it's uh, it's quite manic and uh, I don't know. All all things eventually uh, find some way to control information, and they're inventing things at the moment to aggregate in the chaos of the internet. They they invent um, things to aggregate stories on, on themes from uh, the chaos of it, and that's what news agencies used to do, I guess. But now. Oh, yes, yeah. But nobody looks at it. That's a funny thing about the advertising on the internet is big, but um, in some ways people don't look at advertising on the internet, but in some ways it's becoming much more intimate and uh, people are... people are uh, It's inside their brains much more than, than it used to be um, 30, 40 years ago. And like I said, when I kept putting the unknown and future into... Uh, a social network, it, some, something in it was watching me and it came back with a suggestion, I go to this thing. So there, there's something quite evil and insidious about, about it as well. Sorry, to, that's just my opinion, of course. Hello? Yeah. Um, thanks, Dave, uh, for your talk today. It was really interesting. Um, I wonder what you thought about or whether you knew anything about... Um, This thing I I watched on Tuesday for 12 hours, could you believe it, um, on the internet, which was three musicians and an author who got together uh, and their challenge was to write eight songs in eight hours and Mm. record them in that time space. And what they actually did was they wrote six, Mm. learnt them, um, rehearsed them and recorded them in over 12 hours. And then the music was for sale immediately. Uh Um, And I just wondered whether you'd seen that and what you thought of it. Um, and whether what you thought of that as a principle for musicians going forward, you know, in terms of owning their own music and selling it directly to people via the net. And I guess, and sorry, the other good thing about it was that people who were watching, and there were around 6,000 people who were watching, and we were all talking to one another mm-hmm. about what was happening um, mm. on screen. So it was a really interactive experience. Yes. It all, all sounds very positive in that, but... Uh I think my general uh, mode is usually quite um, 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 I like things in the real world a lot more um, like um, always use an artist for, to make our illustrations for our books and records that he does everything by hand in a collage rather than, uh, than using Photoshop that kind of thing but uh Let's say there were 6,000 people on it. That's the, my thing about the internet is that uh, rather than people being exposed, you're coming on the train and everybody's got 
their iPods on, they're controlling ev- all their environment. Then they're not ever walking past a shop and hearing something by accident or um, 6,000 people on there is very good, but people spiral down into, into smaller worlds of like-minded types. You know, I'm not, I'm not really interested in that myself. You know, I, I like to meet all kinds of different people, you know, by accident. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the discussion in the uh, destruction of the music business, for instance, has been uh, led by arguments that the artists are always ripped off and the big companies are bad. And, and that is not always the ca- not always the case. And and it used to be in the uh, they call it the empirical the imperial period of large record companies. Uh, when recording was expensive, it stopped people from doing things early on, and that was great. Now anybody can do it, and there's so much rubbish. It's it's better if if it was harder. It it makes people try harder and. Uh, there are many strange things, like a optimum le- length for, for a song is three minutes. That comes from the world of 78 records or something. That was the, how much they could fit on them. Uh, you know, it's an old school thing. I, I do like things like that, small communities and that getting together. It's very intimate, but uh, I also do like the larger possibilities of crossing over to people by accident. Sarah. No, this has got nothing to do with anything, or maybe it does. Good. What is the significance of the lurid yellow mist? Oh, that's my band, yeah. <laughs> my band is called the Lurid Yellow Mist. Uh, it's from an old song of mine where I uh, was based on a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man because I liked 50 sci fi movies. And in The Incredible Shrinking Man, he drives his power boat through a mist and he begins to shrink. It's a post-nuclear thing. But it was a black and white film, but I always imagined it was lurid yellow. <laughs> and uh, since then, people are always saying, what are you talking about, urine or something? And uh, sounds a bit psychedelic too. You know, so, but it's also, uh, as a performer... Uh, uh, as a performer, you might be in a little world or a bigger world, or but uh, once you've made a couple of records, you've uh, or done a few things, you're, you're, there's a time lag between what people perceive of you and you're presenting something new, and that's like a fog you appear in. And mine is a lurid yellow mist that I appear out of. Stupid, I know. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming along today.